Hello, this is Angelia, and you are listening to or watching the podcast, Why You Do What You Do. It's a podcast that talks about human development and psychology to try and maybe help you figure out a little bit more about why you do what you do. Um, and last time we were talking about parenting styles. I remember the authoritarian, uh, not such a good outcome. Your children are going to rebel and do the stuff you don't want them to do. Uh, permissive, the kids are going to be lost in the world. It's going to have no idea what to do because, uh, you know, uh, everybody's not going to just let them do whatever they want to when they get out into the real world. So it's authoritative. Parenting is the best style where you talk to the kid like they're a human being. You teach them things um, and you give them advice, but ultimately they're going to learn their lessons on their own just like we all did. <laughs> so we're going to pick back up on that. Um, authoritative parenting may bolster an adolescent's self-image um, because you're being, you know, usually uh, truthful with your kids, hopefully, um, and giving them good praise. You know, that's something I tried to make sure to do. To don't just give negative feedback, give positive feedback, too. Um, a questionnaire survey of 8,700 9th to 12th graders in Wisconsin and California high schools concluded that the more involvement, autonomy granting, and structure that adolescents perceive from their parents, the more positively teens evaluate their own general conduct, psychosocial development, and mental health. So, the more you're involved with your child, the better off they're going to be mentally and emotionally. Now, you don't want to micromanage every little aspect of their life because then you're flowing into the authoritarian, you know, uh, line. Um, autonomy granting. I let my kids have some autonomy. Do things their way as long as it got done right. Uh, and uh, go places, you know, we had rules for, okay, when you're in grade school, you can only be on the street, you know. Uh, once you get to middle school, you can be on the block. You know, once you get to high school, you can be in the neighborhood. You know, uh, we had rules like that. So, allow your child some freedom, some autonomy, um, because then that's how they learn to take care of themselves. Um, structure uh, that they perceive uh, from their parents. If you're providing a structured home, they're going to feel more secure and more able to participate in a structure. Uh, which they're going to need when they become grown-ups. So, like I said, we had a schedule, you know. Uh, and then on days where we had, like, soccer practice, where uh, that we couldn't meet our schedule, we had priorities. You know, and that's what I taught them, that sometimes life can't be scheduled. Sometimes you have to prioritize. So, on a day that you can't work the schedule, prioritize. <laughs> um, the more positively teens evaluate their own general conduct, because... They see themselves as being, you know, a decent person if you're treating them like they're a decent person. Um, psychosocial development. Uh, again, if you're allowing them to have friends and be friends and teaching them how to be a friend to others, they're going to, you know, be more socially adept. Um, and they're, of course, going to be more mentally healthy. So, authoritarian parenting is the way to go. Um, you know. When adolescents thought their parents were trying to dominate their psychological experience, their emotional health suffered more than when parents tried to control their behavior. Um, and I was told what to think a lot. <laughs> you can't tell a person what to think. Um, you can give them advice. You know, I have a son that disagrees with me uh, politically and I give him advice all the time and try to show him the error of his ways. <laughs> like. But don't you see this? Look at this. This is showing you that this is how it's really done. And this is not what's true. Just because they're saying this doesn't make it true. Um, so, you know, uh, telling your child what to think is going to mess them up more than trying to control their behavior. Because they understand that you expect them to behave in a certain way and that you're going to dictate that. But when you try to tell your child how to think... Uh, that messes them up because they have their own mind. They're going to think how they think. And when you start trying to macromanage the way they think, they become basically blanked out because they don't trust their own instincts. They don't trust their own thought process. They fall back on yours. And then 
when yours doesn't work at some point in their life, they have no idea how to think for themselves. Um, so that's a very bad disservice you do to your children um, if you're trying to control the way they think. At the same time, teens whose parents were strict in enforcing behavioral rules had fewer behavioral problems. And of course, that goes without saying because if they're not allowed to go out and behave anyway, then they won't have the behavior problems. So <laughs> that's just, you know, part of the deal, but that's not necessarily a good way to treat your kids. Susceptibility to peer pressure and deviant or antisocial behavior, such as drug use, than those with more lenient parents. So the harder you are on these kids, the more apt they are to show a susceptibility to peer pressure because they know you're not right and you're not doing it right. So they're going to listen to these other little people out in the world, which is a bad thing. We all know how Lord of the Flies worked out. Uh, so, you know, peer pressure is not the way to go. Um, and deviant behavior uh, it might be a coping mechanism. There are people who uh, participated in deviant behavior as a coping mechanism to the stress in their life. Um, and antisocial behavior. Um, if they see their parents, you know, being mean, they're going to be mean to other people. Like I said uh, earlier today, misery loves company. So if they're miserable, they're going to do that. Um, and drug use as an escape. You know, uh, they're having a uh, grip on them like this. Um, they're stressed out. So they're going to use that escape. <clears throat> Adolescents with strict parents tended to develop self-control, self-discipline, and good study and personal habits. So, you know, uh, you can be strict and not damaging to your child. Um, and you can teach them some self-control, some self-discipline, um, and good study and personal habits. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to be mean to them in order to do that. Those whose parents gave them psychological autonomy tended to become self-confident and competent in both academic and social realms. So the parents who act like they trust their kid um, and let them have a life um, felt better about themselves. Um, they were able to go out and succeed and, you know, have successful friendships and a decent life. Um, they wanted to achieve and believe they could do what they set out to do. Um, and that's a good thing you need to instill in your children. Confidence. Um, because I had none. I came up, you know, I was told that I was basically useless, stupid, you know, um, property. Uh, so that's kind of the opinion I had of myself when I left home. Um, and so I allowed myself to be treated that way. Um, and uh, at some point... I was like, you know what? No, no, this is not okay. Um, I ended up going back to school and learned, you know, uh, that uh, I was programmed <laughs> and I needed to be deprogrammed. Uh, so, you know, uh, I learned how to be a, uh, you know, a good, wise, loving, decent person, which is not how I was programmed to be, <laughs> you know, or to have any respect for myself. There was no respect or confidence allowed. Um, that was a bad thing. Uh, so, you know, that means you were uh, going to be autonomous and not under the thumb. Uh, so, you know, I had to relearn how to be a person. <laughs> and a lot of people out there have this same problem. Uh, so, you know, take heart if that was something you went through that you're not alone and a lot of us go through that. <coughs> <clears throat> uh, family structure and mother's employment. Divorce and single parenting do not necessarily produce problem adolescence because it's the quality, not the quantity of parents, that matters. A review of the literature suggests that the detrimental effects of single parent living have been overstated. Um, and you know, uh, we're not going to get into that. A lot of the researchers were men and, you know, we're just, yeah. Uh, by adolescence, differences in school achievement, self-esteem, 
and attitudes toward gender rules among children in such families may not be maybe minor or non-existent when other factors such as socioeconomic status and parental conflict are held constant so um the child may not suffer any more than a normal kid who you know uh has two parents in the house especially if the one parent um is maintaining the house uh and maintaining the social order in the house so that it is a loving home in other words it is the atmosphere in the home that makes the difference if you're going to be in a supportive uh, loving home you're going to come up and be a supportive loving person if you're in a unsupportive hateful home you're probably going to come up and be an unsupportive hateful person in a longitudinal study Adolescent boys and girls whose parents, oh dear, let me fix this before we have a problem. You can see me wandering off here. That's okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'll come right back. Only these who are watching it gotta see me getting up, sitting back down. <laughs> see now, it's now it's fine again. You know, I forgot to plug my plug in. Um. So, it, the, the type of home that you're in is what makes the difference. You're either in a happy home or an unhappy home. And that's going to reflect throughout your life, your attitude. Unless you get some intervention. I'm going to sneeze. I'm trying not to sneeze. I'm sure you Ooh, see me here. I'm trying to not sneeze. <laughs> um... In the study, adolescents uh, whose parents later divorced showed more academic, psychological, and behavioral problems before the breakup than peers whose parents did not divorce. So, if there's drama and trauma going on in the home before the divorce, that's going to affect them, you know, more so than the divorce, honestly, um, because that's going to carry over throughout the divorce. Um, there's going to be fighting and backbiting and you know pitting the kids against each other um and that's hard on the kids um so you know people who have a congenial divorce that's going to be less hard on the kids excuse me it may well be that in such cases the divorce by reducing face-to-face -face conflict with the family results in relatively little further damage to the child so if there's a lot of fighting in the home when the one parent leaves um, then there's that fighting's not happening anymore, hopefully. Um, and like I said, if there's drama between the parents, then that spills over sometimes. But if there's, you know, a lot of fighting and abuse in the home, when that stops, that's actually a relief to the kids. Then they don't have to deal with that anymore. They don't have to carry that, you know, inside of them anymore. Um, they can get on with life at mom's, life at dad's, you know, and move on from that. Parental support may be more important than family structure. So, um, the way you support and love your kids is more important than if you have a mate in the home. Um, you know, um, look out in nature, you know, if you look at, uh, the mother cougar, you know, uh, she gives birth to her kids, the male better stay away. Because if, you know, he threatens her kids, she's gonna claw his face off. So, <laughs> You yeah, know, uh, it's more important that you have a supportive, loving home than that you have a home with two parents in it. In one study of 254 urban African-American adolescent boys, those living with a single mother were no more likely than those in two-parent households to use alcohol or drugs, to become delinquent, to drop out of school, or to have psychological problems. So, um, if they came from a home where mom was taking care of business um, and being supportive and loving to them, they were no more likely to have problems uh, than a two-parent household child. You know, it's, again, like I said, it's quality, not quantity. The only difference was a positive one. 
Sons in single mother households experienced more parental support than others did. So, let's just, you know, I've heard dads say, why does moms get all the credit? Well, in general, moms are more verbal. We talk more. We deal more with emotions. Um, and we're more supportive and loving. Overall, that's just how women are. Um, now, you know, there are men that fall into that. I don't hear no fussy about men. Like, me, But <laughs> there are men like that, too. But in general, moms listen more. Moms deal with your emotions more. Um, and moms are more supportive and loving. Um, and that's just how we are. So, you know, uh, a lot of people in single mother homes are getting a good upbringing because mom is present for them. Now, certainly not the case in all of them, and I've heard some horror stories, um, but in a lot of homes, that's the case. It may be that the mothers provided extra support uh, to compensate for the father's absence. Um, and I know I did, I, I feel sorry for my little kids that their dad did what he did and had to go. Um, so, yeah, I was nicer to them than, you know, uh, sometimes I should, probably should have been. But, uh, you know, um, I wanted them to know that they were supported and what decisions they make with their life, that I love them no matter what. Um, and, you know, uh, that somebody was there who could think and control their emotions, you know, and could be there for them. However, many fathers also continued to be involved in their sons' lives, and this involvement was related to positive outcomes, if the father is a positive person, and he's also being <coughs> loving and supportive, and, you know, that's sometimes the case. So, <coughs> if the parents just can't get along and they need to separate, uh, then it's good if the kids have two places where they're feeling loved and supported. Genetic factors may play a role in some aspects of adjustment to parental divorce. Um, because remember we uh, learned about, you know, genetic predisposition to stress and anxiety. So, you know, if your predisposition genetically to have depression and anxiety and stress, um, then this is going to hit you harder than someone who is not. In a prospective study of 210 biological families and 188 adoptive families, parental divorce played a greater part in 12-year-old biological children's self-esteem and social and academic competence than in adoptive children's. So, the biological children, uh, let's see how to put this nicely, were more emo emotionally invested in the parents relationship um, whereas adoptive children weren't as and that's because they knew they know they're adopted and you know um, they are with these people and they might have been with other people in foster homes and you know the orphanage and so you know um, it doesn't affect them as much and that doesn't sound so nice sometimes when you say it that way but they did the study, not me. So, <laughs> this finding suggests that a passive genotype environment correlation was at work since the biological parents provided their children with both genes and environmental experiences, whereas the adoptive parents provided only environmental experiences. So, you know, again, um, <coughs> you inherit these things, and, you know, the way you were raised matters. Um, so, you know, if, um, you were adopted, you might not have the stress and anxiety that the family naturally has. So you might not have the same reaction as your adopted brother or sister would have. And that's fine because you're different people. We're all different. Interestingly, no genetic influence appeared to exist on children's mental health problems and substance abuse after divorce. So, you know, um, mental health is a thing in and of itself, and substance abuse is a thing in and of itself. Um, divorce of the parents is not going to drive the child to that problem. It can cause problems if there is a predisposition to these problems. 
If anything, the adopted children show greater distress in these areas. So it might be that the adopted children were concerned, oh, I had this at home, now this home is breaking up. What's going to happen to me? Are they going to keep me? You know, are they going to send me back somewhere to foster care? You know, so that's actually more of a stressor for them. The impact of a mother's work outside the home may depend on whether there are two parents or only one in the household. Um, and when I was divorced, I had to work. We had bills to pay. Uh, child support was not enough. Um, so, you know, I would work uh, full part-time, as they call it, you know, uh, about six hours a day. Um, I had my own business. I was, you know, our, our people nowadays call it your side hustle. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I was doing that uh, to bring in some money uh, because, you know, uh, the kids had to eat, the kids had to have clothes to wear, so did I, you know. So, you know, mom can't always sit at home, you know. If you got a, a rich husband that can pay you some good child support, <laughs> good, good for you, I guess, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not how it really works for most of us. Most of us have to stay out there doing something. Often a single mother... Um, must work to stave off economic disaster. <coughs> Certainly. <coughs> how her working affects her teenage children may hinge on how much time and energy she has left over to spend with them. Um, and, and there were days at the end of the day I didn't have the energy to deal. You know, I was tired. Uh, especially if it was a stressful day at work. And there were times I, I felt sorry for, you know, my little kid because I knew he probably wasn't getting the best of my attention. Uh, but I was just, just too tired to deal, um, you know, and I've even told that to him, you know, I'm sorry if I wasn't there for you as much as I should have been, and he's like, no, you did great, you know, I, you did a great job, um, so, you know, I'm happy, all three of my kids have told me I, I did a good job, so, you know, <laughs> you know, that makes me feel good, because I tried. How well she keeps track of their whereabouts, um, and that is something uh, and only one of mine have I ever had to track down. Um, <coughs> he was not where he was supposed to be. And I started calling, you know, friends and things. And <coughs> finally tracked him down. He was out after curfew. Um, and so he had a little bit of a, uh, some punishment coming. <laughs> um, what kind of role model she provides? You know, and that's, that's the thing. Children learn, learn what they live. Um, and they learn from what they see. So, if you want them to be decent people, you need to be a decent person. So, you know, remember you're a role model and they're watching you. Little eyes are watching. Without close, consistent supervision, adolescents are more susceptible to peer pressure. And I think we all know that. So-and-so tries to talk you into something, you're like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then you want to be cool or, you know, popular or whatever. So you do it, you know. Um, and if you're not keeping up with them, they're out there with these people. And we went, remember we were just talking about the Lord of the Flies thing. Uh, that never usually has a good outcome, does it? High school students who are unsupervised after school tend to smoke, drink, use marijuana, or engage in other risky behavior. Um, so, you know, if you're not watching, you know, there's there's a line in the movie like that, uh, What Dreams May Come. It's like, no one was watching anyway. You know, so they figure, eh, nobody cares. I'll do what I want. To be depressed, again, depression, if the parents are not involved in their life, you know, uh, I, I felt a lot of times mine were just, you know, I wasn't important enough, you know, to be a part of their life. They had their own little deals going and, you know, uh, maybe what this child or that child was for one reason or another. One was a favorite, one was a boy, um, but I was not important enough, you know, to be considered, you know, so. And to have low grades uh, because they figure the parents don't care. So, parents don't care, I don't care either. You know, again, children, your attitudes rub off on those kids. Among 1,130 teens in a low-income neighborhood, those who reported less parental monitoring were le more likely to test positive for STDs, to engage in risky sexual behavior, 
and to have histories of alcohol or marijuana use, fighting, and arrests. So, if nobody's watching the kids, the kids are watching themselves. And we see how that evidences. <laughs> They're doing what they want to do. However, as long as parents know where their son or daughter is, their physical absence does not significantly increase the risk of problems. Um, so, by knowing, where are you going to be? Because the kid knows if they say they're going to be at so-and-so's um, and you need to call them at so-and-so's, they better be at so-and-so's. Because then if you have to track them down, there's going to be some trouble. <laughs> when parents feel pressure at work, parent-child conflict tends to be rise. And adolescents' well-being may suffer. So if the parent comes home all stressed out, um, in a negative mood, then they might take it out on the kid. And the kid feels this negativity towards them, and they're like, you know, geez, thanks a lot. You know, I was just here doing nothing, and, you know, I have to hear this crap. So, you know, um, it can lead to some relationship issues um, if you bring stress from work home. And that's why I always say leave it at the door and then take when you come home take a break for yourself take a 15 30 minute you know 10 minute break whatever you feel like you need go in your room be alone listen to some music you know or whatever and then come back out to the family and relate to them you know without having the direct current from work the negative current spilling over in your family life Mothers who feel overloaded tend to become less caring and accepting, and their children often show behavior problems. Um, so, you know, bad bad mom, bad kids. <laughs> you know, that's kind of something I've said, you know, some of my students. You know, if you come home and all you got for your kids is a bad attitude, don't expect a good one back. Because <laughs> you give the bad, you're going to get the bad back. That's the way it is. When mothers are stressed, you know, the tensions between them and the fathers increase as well. So, you know, uh, moms, when they come home, um, and they're going to have some problems with dad. And dads are the same way. You know, a lot of dads bring this stuff home and gripe and fuss, you know. Um, and you shouldn't do that. Like I said, you should leave work at the door. Don't bring it into the house. Um, if you need to decompress... Go in your room, listen to music, watch TV, videos, whatever makes you, you know, de-stress. Then come out and deal with the family, you know, like that, you know. Uh, it's better than taking your bad work day out on your family. <laughs> A mother's work status helps shape adolescents' attitudes towards women's roles. Um, so, if you have to work, they know people have to work, you know. Um, and it lets your son see that women aren't, you know, just tied to the house, you know, housewives can't do anything else. You know, women are smart. Um, I'm not going to get into who's smarter or what, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, women are capable. We can do the same things as men. We might have to do it differently, you know, like with my disability, I can do a lot of things. I might have to adapt the way I do it, you know, but. I can figure out sometimes ways to do things. Now, there are a lot of things I just can't do, um, and I've had to adapt. Um, but sons learn that women are smart and they can do things, and daughters learn this too, which is important, you know, so that the daughter don't think her choice in life is to find a good man to marry and have a bunch of kids and take care of her house all day long and feel unfulfilled with the rest of her life and then have a midlife crisis and you know, run off with some dude to Florida or whatever. <laughs> you know. Uh, teenage sons and working mothers tend to have more flexible attitudes towards gender roles when they have warm relationships with their mothers. And teenage daughters show unstereotyped attitudes when their mothers are happy with their dual roles. Because let's face it, even in a two-person household, nine times out of ten, the mom's carrying the work and the home load. Mothers, uh, there was a statistic a while back, I think it was like 30 some odd percent more. But women still do the lion's share of the housework. You know, men do a lot of the outside mowing and trimming and things like that. 
Uh, women do the lion's share of the housework. We do the clothes washing, we do the washing of the dishes, cleaning of the kitchen, cleaning of the bathroom, picking up in the house, you know, dusting, polishing, shining, sweeping, vacuuming, you know, women still do the lion's share of the housework. Um, now, more and more men are, you know, coming in and saying, oh, let me help you. Um, or there are men who are stay-at-home. I have a nephew, he's a stay-at-home dad. And also he's taking on the lion's share and letting his wife, you know, make the money because she was making more money. So, you know, it all just depends. Surprisingly, some of the strongest gender typing occurs in families with full-time employed mothers. So, you know, there are men who feel a bit threatened by full-time employed moms, um, especially if she makes a little more money. Um, and so they will put those sexist words out there, you know, and make sexist jokes, you know. Um, I've heard several, uh, my husband was pretty bad about it um, before. Um, and I've kind of checked him on that. Uh, but, you know, talking about women's work, uh, women are short uh, so they can, you know, uh, clean in the better places. Their feet are small so they can get closer to the stove. You know, I've heard a lot of sexist jokes. Uh, so, unfortunately, there are men who feel threatened in their masculinity. So, they have to make these jokes, which tells me they're not really men at all. You know, they're little boys being butt babies, but... <laughs> You know, um, gender divisions may be fairly uh, egalitarian during the week when everyone is occupied with work or school. Um, so, you know, the, during the week, everybody's busy doing the things, trying to get things done. So, you know, there's not as much talk like that during the week. On weekends, however, girls, like their mothers, do a larger share of the housework and of care of younger siblings so on the weekends the guys like I said they go out and do yard work things like that um, take out the garbage and then you know mom's left to clean the rest of the entire house so <laughs> you know uh, not not exactly fair guys uh, well I'm gonna leave you right there um, hopefully this has helped you figure out maybe a little bit more about why you do what you do uh, please like and uh, share this uh, educational program so we can uh, spread it around the world. Um, if you want to help me out, subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to help me out even more, go to my Patreon page and become a patron. That's all for now. Until next time.